welcome both the in-person and the remote crowd to our final talk, the IMS Medallion Lecture by Alexi Bordin. Because it is a medallion lecture, uh, let me read the, um, the standard announcement for this. Each year, IMS nominates eight medallion lectures in fields across the IMS's subject range. The award of a medallion signals the honor inherent in being selected to give one of these lectures. IMS awards the medallion to Alexi Bordin and invites you to present a medallion lecture entitled Deformed Polynuclear Growth in One Plus One Dimensions. I would like to follow that up with a few more specific remarks about your, uh, by way of introduction. Although I should ask, did you receive your medallion lecture in the mail? Uh, your medallion, your, the actual medallion, I'm sorry, not the lecture, but the medal. I, I think you're muted, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. You mean whether I received the actual medallion in the mail? Yes, I have. Yeah. Great. Yes, if you were here in person, I was supposed to give it to you, but I guess that will have to uh, that will have to suffice. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Boradine is professor of mathematics at at MIT and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His research lies at the interface of representation theory, probability, and statistical physics, especially the problems related to random matrix theory, combinatorics, and integral systems. He's the founder of Integrable Probability Theory and has authored more than 120 research articles. His contribution has been highly recognized, including the prize of the Moscow Mathematical Society in 2003, the prize of the European Mathematical Society in 2008, the Liver Prize and the Henri Poincaré Prize in 2015, an Alexanderson Award and the Fermat Prize in 2019. He was the recipient of a long-term research fellowship from the Clay Mathematics Institute, a Simons Fellowship in 2016, and a Simons Investigatorship in 2020, possibly even more. I couldn't even memorize that. I had to have notes. So uh, Professor Bordin is extremely well-recognized and deservedly so, and so we're very fortunate to have him give his medallion lecture here at SSP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a, a very flattering introduction. I'm uh, truly honored to be invited to give the IMS uh, medallion lecture. Um, I'm very sorry I couldn't be there in person today. Um, it's great to finally have uh, live conferences happening. Um, apologies for that. And um, I hope there is still something you could you would be able to get out of my um, Zoom presentation. So the, um, the title of uh, my talk is there, Deformed Polynuclear Growth in, in One Plus One Dimensions. So maybe before speaking about um, polynu uh, deformed polynuclear growth, I should start from undeformed polynuclear growth, what, what that is. And um, you know, one advantage that uh, that Zoom gives is the ability to easily switch between different um, computer um, screens, and so that's what I'll do. So I'll, I'll try to show a simulation of the of the nuclear or the polynuclear growth process in one plus one dimension. So the the picture. I hope you can see the picture. Um, okay, somebody's nodding in the audience. Good, thank you. I I can see when you're nodding, so that's very helpful actually. Um, yeah, so um, the thing to, to watch for now is the, the red line. That's um, the, the main object of interest. And, and you see that um, that line um, starts changing now. So um, it's um, growing, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, it's changing in time. That line uh, um, is now a broken line that consists of horizontal and vertical segments. And so you can think of the vertical segments as um, of little steps or islands that appear on top of the interface. And so you can see that the, the islands, when they appear, they, they always have, um, they, um, oops, that goes backwards. That's not good. Um, they um, always have height one. So they appear as a tiny island of height one and width zero. And then uh, the walls of that island start propagating left and right with constant speed. And then when two islands uh, uh, meet, when the walls meet, they just merge, right? So this is um, a uh, mathematical model for the following physical picture and I imagine that there is a, a flat table 
it could be in higher dimension than one is just um, uh, dimension one is, is the easiest, of course, and the only one where something could be said actually. Um, right, so there is this flat table and uh, there is an oversaturated medium around it. And so on, then on that, on that table, a seed appears. And once the seed appeared, then something starts condensating from that medium around that seed, and then an island starts growing. And then seeds show up on top of the surface randomly. And then that, at those points, immediately the islands start growing. And when they grow, they, they merge along the way. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is the, uh, um, the model. It's called polynuclear growth because, well, it's growing and it's polynuclear because there are several nuclei where the islands start to grow, okay? Does it make sense what I'm saying? Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, um, right. Um, so the, the interest of course is what happens um, when things uh, propagate for a long time. And you could imagine, for example, um, this picture having many more points. Um, let's see, can I do that? Um, and then I, um, I start running it and then you see that there, is, uh, there are many things happening. And so the interface in the end um, gets rough. So the question is, what are the properties of that interface? Um, is it, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what can one say about it? So I, I will be, um, so my um, setup here is um, on the picture right now is of a completely flat table. So that's um, the initial condition that's translation in there and left and right. Um, I will actually be interested in a slightly different geometry, which is um, usually referred to as a, a droplet geometry. And so in that situation, the condition is that all nucleation events, uh, all new islands have to appear on top of the very first island that shows up. So, um, so here is um, the um, um, what the interface will look like in this case. You know, it, it it starts growing from the center, so to say, and then um, if I can increase the number of points, then it will be um, visible that. There is some some sort of a droplet that shows up. It's no longer translation in the area, and there is a little droplet that's that's growing. Right now, um, also in this picture, let me try to explain what those uh, blue dots are. Right, so these blue dots, and in general, the bottom half of the picture, they they represent um, the space time of the model. So the horizontal coordinate is space. And the vertical coordinate is time, and you see that when I start running my uh, um, my simulation, actually it's not my simulation; it was done by Patrick Ferrari, but uh, for this talk it's my simulation. And so um, you see that there is this horizontal line that runs through um, these blue points, and so this line is um, a time slice. And, and, and whenever that line crosses a blue point, that's when a new island shows up. So the blue points are the nucleation events in, in space time. And maybe again, let me decrease the number of points so that it becomes um, better visible. So you can see that nothing has appeared so far. And then uh, my uh, moving uh, line and the bottom hasn't crossed any blue points yet. So now it's about to cross two blue points. And so two islands will show up. There we go, they already merged. Now one more will show up because of the next blue point. There, there we go. And then uh, and you see that whenever there is a blue dot that's being consumed, that's when an island pops up. So I didn't say how the randomness um, is defined in the model. And so now I can say the randomness is such that uh, um, these blue dots they form a Poisson process um, in um, the corresponding space-time domain. So that means that the, the nucleation events are independent in both space and time. So this is, um, this is the, uh, um, the, um, the polynuclear growth model. Um, let me uh, make a connection of this um, 
seemingly completely probabilistic or maybe a math physics -y object to um, a combinatorial one. So for that, I'll start drawing. Um, now, this is my illustration of the quadrant that we've just seen in the simulation. So this was um, the space, I'll call it X. And this direction is uh, time. And I use, I'll use i use the letter tau to, to denote it. And so in the quadrant, I had these, uh, um, I had these uh, nucleation events. Now, instead of um, drawing them in, in this format, what I will do, I'll, I'll turn the picture by 45 degrees. So I'll instead draw it like this. So again, this is uh, space and this is time. And so here we have, uh, I have a few points. And so now if I want to understand um, the, the, um, the position of that uh, red interface that we saw in the simulation, it's known as the height function of the model. Um, the way to do it from the nucleation events is the following. One imagines that out of each nucleation event, uh, two rays start out, go into the right and up like this. And so these rays in space time, they can respond to the two walls of the island moving left and right with constant speed. So this is sort of the light cone generated by that nucleation event, right? The, the expansion of the two walls. And then, so, and then when two walls meet, like, he, like, uh, like here, for example. So when, when two rays intersect, that, that corresponds to the two walls meeting or two islands merging. And so they just annihilate, annihilate each other. They disappear. And then uh, uh, the picture will look like this for the five nucleation events that, that, that I drew. And then if I want to measure the height function or the position of my interface at some point in space time. So here I take a point xt and then I want to know the, the height function. So the height function at this point, then what I have to do is I have to count the number of um, these broken interfaces between the origin and the point that I'm observing at. And so this height in this case is going to be equal to two. So this is nothing but the reformulation of my uh, simulation so far. But now I'll, I'll do a little more. I will number my um, uh, nucleation events. So I will number them by ordering in um, one of the coordinates. So I'll take, uh, so now I'll, I'll take the usual X, Y coordinates of the quadrant. And so if I number my points one, two, th one, two, three, four, and five, then if I look at the, um, Y coordinate, I will observe a different order, right? So there will be the first will be the point four, and then the next one will be two, and then uh, one, and then this one will be five, and three will be the last one. So if I read now um, bottom to top these coordinates, I get four, two, one, five, three which is a permutation um, of one, two, three, four, five. And then it's natural to ask, does this height mean anything in terms of this permutation? And the answer is actually pretty neat. One needs to look at the increasing subsequences in this permutation. So for example, um, I don't know, two, five is an increasing subsequence over here. And so if I, um, if I look at the corresponding points in my picture, so this is two and this is five, then um, one can see that there is actually a path that, that goes in upright direction that goes through these two points and ends up at my uh, location where I observe the height. So the conclusion actually is that the height 
is equal to the length of the longest increase in subsequence increase in subsequence of um, my random permutation of the permutation of the permutation. So if uh, my points are random and distributed according to the Poisson process, once I condition on the number of points that I observe, for example, five like here, then um, um, the distribution on permutations that's getting induced is just the uniform distribution. So if I look at uniformly random permutation and I look at its length of the longest increase in subsequence, that will produce the same answer as my original model of, um, of polynuclear growth. So um, this is um, a pretty nice connection um, that um, also shows why um, these types of problems were and, and are still in, of interest in, in um, combinatorics. So now, um, hopefully the polynuclear growth is clear. Now, what does deformed mean? So the word deformed um, comes from the following thing. So before, what happened is that whenever in my interface, I had two walls that were moving towards each other and they met, then um, this gap just disappeared. The walls just merged. So in the deformed situation, um, there will be a, an additional choice of what happens. And so the choice is that it could still happen. I mean, th they could still just merge and nothing happens there. So we just get an interface without any bumps there. And so this will happen with uh, some probability. So this will happen with probability. I'll use a parameter between zero and one. And so this will happen with probability T. And then with the complementary probability, what will happen is that once these two walls merge, there is a new island that shows up on top. So this merging event, event, event becomes a new nucleation event for the model itself. So this will, um, um, this will change the, the, the growth of the interface a little bit. And all, all these events are going to be independent. There is the additional randomness um, parameterized by, by this T. And again, uh, the question of interest is the same. What does um, the interface do at large time? Now, um, so the undeformed case corresponds to uh, T being one. And so we just observe the top event. And now um, if we think about the case uh, T equals zero, so the other extreme case. So this corresponds to um, this bottom uh, picture showing up all the time. Now, what this means is that whenever my rays in the picture meet, they never annihilate. They just keep going straight again. And so this removes any interaction between nucleation events whatsoever. And so if we count the, the height function in this case, when, it, when the rays don't talk to each other, they just go through each other. Then what we will be counting is just the number of points in the, uh, in the rectangle between the origin and the observation point. And so that in the Poisson process, that number of points is Poisson distributed. And so at large time, Poisson distribution follows uh, central limit theorem. And so the height function will just uh, be asymptotically um, normal just by the classical central limit theorem. Now, of course, the, uh, it's not the, the interesting case for us. The interesting case is either um, t equal to one, the undeformed one. So that goes back actually to, so the, the complete solution to that problem goes back more than 20 years. I'll, I'll say um, exactly where. And um, um, the, uh, the T being exactly between zero and one. So that's um, actually the other thing that will be interesting to us is some sort of a tra transition regime between this T equal to one case and the non-interesting 
Gaussian case t equal to zero, but I'll get there. So, um, okay, so I'm, I spend a lot of time on defining the models. Let me state the, the results that, that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, let me say that this is a joint work with um, um, two um, friends, Amol Agarwal and uh, Michael Wheeler. So this is in, in our joint paper um, that is available on, on the archive. So I'll, I'll state two theorems. So theorem one um, says the following, that for a fixed T between um, not including zero, the Gaussian case, but including one, um, the original case, if I take um, the limit, so I'll put here tau squared minus x squared goes to infinity. So this condition just means that we are um, where the interface is growing. That's all, it doesn't mean anything else, that we are in the cone where the growth is happening. Um, and then I compute the probability that the height function, so I'll put here um, T to indicate that the whole model depends on T. Actually, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll add the assumption. So I'll assume that's just for, um, for convenience of normalization, that the intensity of the Poisson process in the quadrant of the Poisson process is um, one minus T. This is, I mean, I could keep it one, um, it will just change the constants that participate in the statement. Um, it's convenient to have it normalized a little bit differently. Um, okay, so I, I take my height function at the point x, x tau. Then I need to subtract um, an appropriate quantity, which ends up being this. And then uh, that's the law of large numbers behavior. And then once I divide by um, the law of large numbers to the power one over three. So there is one six sitting here, um, sort of a, a, a unusual um, exponent for classical probability. Then this limit exists. <clears throat> and this limit is, um, the Tracy Widom um, distribution. So this is something known as the Tracy Widom distribution. It's not a normal um, very normal distribution, not a Gaussian. Tracy Widom distribution first appeared in, in random matrices uh, back in 1993. It governs the behavior of the largest eigenvalue of um, Gaussian or Mission random matrices. Um, I don't want to write a formula for, for this distribution. Um, I don't think it will say much. I, mean, I, I can roughly plot it. It, it sort of uh, reminds a Gaussian a little bit, but it, it's slightly shifted and its tails actually are not, are not symmetric and they're also not of Gaussian type. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and the, key role, the key role that it plays that it actually is a universal um, distribution for um, many growth processes. So it's supposed to be the universal limit um, of one point distributions of the so-called KPZ universality class. But I don't want to go there. Suffice it to say that we see that here, independently of our parameter T, our growth models have the same fluctuation behavior. So there is a little bit of a universality happening here as well. Now I'll say that when T is equal to one, so this is the undeformed case, undeformed case. Then this statement goes back to the work by Bike, Dave, and Johansson, sort of a, a famous paper um, that um, was literally addressing the question of the asymptotics of the longest increasing subsequences. And so that's more than, um, than 20. That's more than 20 years old. Okay, 
Now that's um, that's the first statement. It may not be too surprising given the fact that Tracy Wyndham distribution is really supposed to be the universal object. Now I'll also state um, the second theorem. So the second theorem addresses the question of how to go from the Tracy Wyndham distribution to the normal distribution that shows up in t equals zero situation. Right, so how to pass from this, um, you know, non-trivial statement related to random matrices and, and, and things like that to the, the classical central limit theorem. So that transition should happen when uh, T um, approaches um, zero, right? And, uh, for some reason I have, um, mm, I might have confused uh, T. Right, sorry. I mean, I, I, I got T and one minus T flipped. So um, <laughs> let me run it backwards. So this is going to be one minus T, this is going to be T. And so when T is one, this is what's going on. And when T is zero, this is what is going on. And so here instead, I will have uh, strict inequality in the wrong place. So T equals zero is the undeformed case. Sorry about that. Now, um, when I want to see the transition, what I will want to see is T getting close to one. So I'm trying to sort of make this in strict inequality here, um, almost inequality. And so what I'll do is that I will take um, T <coughs> approaching one um, using a small parameter epsilon. And then uh, the statement looks like this. So then the limiting statement looks like this. If I take the limit, Actually, I, I, I will not write the limit like this. I'll write it slightly differently. So I'll take my height function h. I want to evaluate it somewhere far in the quadrant. So I scale, um, I'll scale the position of x and the position of tau. And I subtract the law of large numbers, which is exactly the same as um, it was before. And I'm going to multiply this by epsilon. So the scaling that leads to the limiting theorem is slightly different. Then there is even a logarithmic correction that shows up. And so this converges in distribution when epsilon goes to zero to um, a, a smooth random variable. Now I'll write it in, in a funny form for now. So I'll, um, the, the letter capital T is just uh, tau squared minus x squared. And then um, minus, um, so I'll put here curly h T evaluated at zero. So these symbols so far don't mean anything. This is just some random variable. This is some random variable. And so the reason that I, I write this random variable in, in, such a, in such a form is because this curly H is a, a solution of what's known as the, as the KPZ or cardar porosier equation. So let me rather not write it Let's say that if I um, exponent, exponentiate um, this H denoted by Z, then uh, the Z function will solve um, a much nicer equation. So this is a, a linear stochastic PD. So the derivative in um, The derivative in T is uh, equal to the Laplacian, or just the second derivative in this case, the T of X plus 
um, plus uh, z t of x multiplied by the white noise. So this w dot here, this is the space time white noise. And this this whole PD, this object here, has a name, um, and this is called the um, stochastic heat equation. With multiplicative noise. So um, this statement looks probably quite complicated. And if you if you've never seen this before, then um, at least to me this would have looked scary. You know, the the exponents are difficult. And then there is this uh, logarithmic correction that shows up that's not even algebraic. And, and where do these things come from? And um, you know, oftentimes when, um, when one uh, looks at the literature on, on this topic, on the convergence to the KPZ equation or stochastic heat equation, it will also look complicated. There will be a, um, large formulas that explain how things work and and it it could be repulsive i i, I I'm, I'm i'd be the first to to admit that and so maybe the purpose of um, um the talk that i'm trying to give is to to show that there is a a clean algebraic mechanism you know when it gets to the limit theorems it gets complicated but there is a clean algebraic mechanism that gives rise to, to this kind of limit, limit theorem. And um, these algebraic uh, miracles, if, if, um, if one wants to use that term, are actually um, central to the whole subject so far. Um, sometimes one manages to prove universality statements without them, but this remains so far rare. Um, major, it would be a major breakthrough if somebody comes up with a universality scheme allowing to prove the convergence to Tracy Widom or the convergence to stochastic heat equation um, for large classes of models. But for now, the, the algebraic structure behind remains um, an, important, um, an important ingredient. And that structure at least in my opinion, is actually simpler than um, the final limiting statement that, that one observes in here. Of course, this limiting statement is ultimately what one wants. It's a limiting theorem for the distribution, um, but the path to it is actually um, enjoyable, I think. Now, be, before I try to, to explain a little bit of, of algebra that goes into it, let me say that, um, um, let me say that there are, so what we've seen here is some sort of a transition between the Tracy Widom and the normal. Right? And that transition is being performed using um, the parameter that I called uh, T. That somehow tunes the interaction of the pieces of my model. So this, um, this has been done before on a different, um, on a different model. So maybe um, let me say something about that. So this, this, um, this KPZ equation, or you know, the, the stochastic heat equation in, 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 in different terminology, just by this uh, logarithmic change of variables um, was originally um, obtained from another probabilistic uh, system known as the asymmetric simple exclusion process. So asymmetric simple exclusion process um, is uh, a Markov chain on uh, particle configurations 
um, on the one dimensional lattice. Each location is occupied by no more than a single particle. And as time progresses, um, these particles jump left and right with different uh, jump rates. Let's say um, um, the right jump rate is going to be one and the left, left right, right, the left jump rate is going to be Q with Q between zero and one. And the question is, what happens to such a system? So the particles jump uh, independently. And then of course, if a particle try, tries to jump on top of another particle, then that jump is, is being suppressed. So that's the, uh, the key interaction in the system, the so-called uh, exclusion constraint. And so the question is what happens to the system um, at large times? It was a, an important uh, breakthrough to understand first the behavior when Q is equal to zero. So Q is equal to zero, that's the so-called totally asymmetric simple exclusion. When jumps are one-sided, everything goes to the right. And that again goes back to, to late nineties. Um, that's, um, um, this was the work of, of Kurt Johansson. Um, then, uh, when Q is um, strictly between zero and one, um, so Trace and Widom themselves were able to, for certain initial condition, were able to analyze the asymptotics. So that was around 2008, and they got the Trace of Widom distribution. But then it's also known when Q is equal to one, this is the so called uh, symmetric, so symmetric simple exclusion process. And so this um, actually known to have a Gaussian asymptotics. So clearly at Q equals to one, there is a transition between, um, between uh, Tracy Widom and the symmetric SESEP. And so indeed, in between them, this was this, the first time the KPZ equation was analyzed. Um, the, so when Q goes to one, as time goes to infinity, this is the so-called weak asymmetry limit, weak asymmetry limit. That corresponds to the KPZ equation. So it's a somewhat similar picture. There is a tunable parameter. And then when that parameter is tuned well, um, as time goes, then this uh, new phenomenon shows up, right? So, so um, And, and, and so the, the, this, uh, this PNG model, the polynuclear growth model, is sort of plays um, a similar role. So the, uh, um, you know, both, both, both have these two types of limits um, with a tunable parameter. Also, so the, the exclusion process and uh, the PNG process do not seem quite um, like each other, at least from the definition, they, they don't look um, similar, but they actually um, can, can be seen as coming from um, um, the same parent. So that parent is known as the stochastic six vertex model. And it's also a probabilistic model that's not so difficult to, to define. So let me try to define the stochastic six vertex model. Of course, um, the term, the six vertex model, um, the six vertex model is quite a bit older than either exclusion processes or polynuclear growth processes this, the six vertex model itself um, goes back to early sixties um, and it showed up in um, the study of, um, of um, many body quantum systems. But um, I, I, let me not go into that. The, the, um, let, let me just define the object at hand, the stochastic version of it. So I will look at the quadrant. It's a discrete quadrant, so it's uh, um, z plus by z plus, and so the um, the model itself 
is a prob is a probability measure on paths that go along the lattice in the upright direction. And these paths, they do you know, elementary steps. And um, the condition is that at, at each edge of the lattice, there could be no more than a single path. So the, uh, the name six vertex comes from six, possi six possibilities to draw things around a single vertex. So the six possibilities are you know, the path turned up from coming from the left, the path turned right. Then two paths met and bounced off each other. And then uh, paths go in straight and you know, in, in two directions. So you see there are six, there is a total of six possibilities here. So this is, um, this is the origin of the six. But in the stochastic version, what happens is that whenever a path comes to a vertex, it just needs to decide what it wants to do. And the stochasticity means that there is a Markovian procedure. And the Markovian procedure says that, well, if the path came to a vertex and, uh, um, well, maybe I'll, I'll start with um, path coming from the bottom and then nothing came from the left, then there is some probability that the path will go straight. I'll call it Delta one. Then there is a complementary probability that the path will go right. And the complementary means that this is going to be one minus Delta one. And then uh, there is also a probability to go straight if one comes from the left. So that's Delta two. And then the probability that the path will turn right, this will be one minus Delta two. And then of course the, the probability when the two paths came and they just bounced off each other, this is one because the paths are forbidden to, to, to overlap. So this completely determines the evolution. And so if I have my path starting on the left boundary of the quadrant, the way I drew, I can just uh, inductively define their evolution by you know, these Markovian rules. And so this will produce um, a probability measure on the whole on the whole quadrant. And again, there is a, the notion of a height function. So the configuration can be parameterized by a height function, which basically just counts how many paths passed below the point where I'm observing. So at this, at this location, the height function will be two because there were two paths that, uh, that passed behind it. So this is um, um, the uh, um, so the the um, the stochastic six vertex model. So it was first introduced, let me say, by um, in the physics li physics literature by Guan Chpon back in 1992. At that point, without um, well, without connecting it to let's say polynuclear growth or something like that, this was a, a slightly separate subject. Um, so the, um, the, the fact that the six vertex model is related to ASAP is actually not difficult. Um, the six vertex model, the stochastic six vertex model could be thought of as a discrete, completely discretized version of ASAP. But the connection to the polynuclear growth is actually not, not a triviality. Not a triviality. Now, um, the second sort of object that, that, that I wanted to, to, to mention is uh, now looks, might look completely algebraic. So this object has its origins in, in representation theory and I'll define it completely you know, on this piece of the slide. So don't, don't, don't be discouraged if you don't remember anything from your algebra classes. Um, these are so-called sure measures. And so the sure measures are defined in the following way. One first starts with defining true polynomials, which are uh, poly symmetric polynomials in, um, in a few, in, in finitely many variables. So lambda here is a label 
it's called a partition. This is a sequence of integers. Only finitely many of them are non-zero. So these are integers. And then the Schur polynomial itself depends on a few variables, x1 through xn. And it is defined as the ratio of two determinants. Determinant of xi to the power lambda j plus n minus j divided by the same determinant with lambda is equal to zero. And um, so the, um, the determinants are of size n by n. Now the bottom determinant here is the van der Waals determinant. So the, these polynomials, uh, these short polynomials, um, are, are really central for classical representation theory. They are the so-called irreducible characters of, of, um, of the general linear group of, a, of the complex field. And, um, but you know, for, for now, let's just uh, think of them as, as polynomials. You know, this is the explicit definition. So the, these sure polynomials satisfy uh, many nice properties. You know, one of them is um, uh, the following summation identity. If I take two of these polynomials and uh, I multiply them and add up over all partitions, then the result will be a nice product. This is a multivariate generalization of the formula for the geometric progression. Um, and to prove this formula, one can just use the cauchy binet identity. This is a lin the linear algebraic um, exercise starting from the ratio of the two determinants. So this is known as the Cauchy identity. Once I know the sum, there is a, a way to define a probability measure on my lambdas, where for each lambda, I can assign the weight, which is uh, the product of two sure functions. And then divided by this product, so let's say this is pi divided by pi. And then I'm guaranteed to have these uh, all add, add up to one. So these are uh, sure measures. Um, so I guess this, this definition in this form is, is due to um, Oklinkov in uh, 2000. So um, the sure measures have um, this, um, fairly nice property that they define what's now called a determinantal point process. Determinantal point process. What this means is the following. That if I uh, draw my partition in the following way, this is called uh, the the Yen diagram of a partition. So this will be, um, so this picture is drawn on a lattice, and uh, this length here is um, lambda one. Um, then the next one is lambda two, and so on. The final one is lambda n. So then, if I uh, take this picture. So one can think of it as, as being inside a quadrant. Somehow quadrant plays many different roles in my, in my talk today. And then if I look at all middles of the edges of slope one, and then if I, pro if I project this on the horizontal line, I get a point configuration. It's going to be random. It's just a way to parameterize my partition. 
And so the property, um, so let me call it something, I don't know, let me call it uh, C, point configuration. So the determinantal point process means that if I want to evaluate the probability that a few points are inside my point configuration C, these are the so-called correlation functions, then this probability can be written as a neat determinant. And then uh, the kernel K that goes to inside it is explicit. This is um, very useful. It, it's very rare that, that one can evaluate so, so many correlation functions so explicitly. And in particular, it is this structure uh, that made it possible to, to get to the tracy widom distribution in most cases where it was, um, it was proved. So what's, dist what's distributed here according to the tracy widom distribution, it's the end point. This point here, when the picture becomes large, you can imagine that um, the, the parameter n here gets large, then this point here in the limit will behave, will fluctuate according to the tracy widom distribution. And this is similar to the original way the tracy widom distribution showed up as the largest eigenvalue of random matrices. You can see that this edge point plays the role of the largest eigenvalue somehow, or the smallest eigenvalue, something like that. Okay, now, um, so I, I, I tried to, to draw the six vertex model and the sure measures on two different uh, halves of my picture. So the sure measures are very algebraic. They have these nice determinantal formulas that allows one that allow one to analyze them um, and so on. But they are complicated from the point of view of a probabilist. Why would you, why would you want to study such a um, involved object? On the other hand, the six vertex model on the left here, it's easily defined. You just flip coins every time the paths cross um, across the, um, the vertices of the lattice. Um, it would be nice to understand its large line behavior, but it's hard to do it. And so be between them, there is sort of a miraculous connection. So let me state here theorem. Um, um, so the connection is um, the following, that if I compute the expectation with respect to my stochastic six vertex model of a certain observable that depends on the value of the height function at a particular point. So the observable is a number uh, is always between zero and one, and it's the infinite product of um, the following thing. So this is um, t, right? Um, yeah, I, 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 I should have added the definition in so one second. And this is plus I. So um, zeta here, this is an arbitrary parameter. So this is general, generic, um, just a formal variable if you wish. Now, uh, what is T? So the six vertex model is defined in terms of two deltas, delta one and delta two. So these two deltas um, need to be connected to T in some way where T is the same as uh, the parameter I started with. And so the, the connection is by basically just changing the variable. So, um, The delta one and delta two, their ratio is T. And then uh, in order to state uh, an exact thing, um, an exact theorem, I need to reparameterize delta one in terms of um, variables that depend on rows and columns. So I have two sequences of parameters called C and U. One of them, depends on the rows of my model. So just an integer coordinate across the quadrant and the other one de de depends on the columns of the model. Right. So the expectation of a six vertex model of this object 
is equal to the expectation over the sure measure of another infinite product. And so that infinite product is the product over all points of my point configuration here, so that I denoted by red, of uh, something that looks slightly similar, one plus um, zeta t to the power c. This is sort of a, a magic identity that, that connects the, the two models and it's, um, and it really allows to move the information from the algebraic object in which things are nice and computable to the probabilistic object where one wants to get the limiting theorems. Um, so when T is between zero and one, what happens is that, um, you know, if you look at this expectation, you look at this uh, T to the C over here. And so this, is a quantity that changes, um, that quickly changes between uh, uh, zero and one. You know, if C is increasing, then T to the power C decays quickly. And so what happens is that this whole product is actually going to pick up the distribution function of the largest, uh, well, in this case of the smallest point of my configuration C. And uh, it will it will produce Tracy Widom type type behavior, and that's the reason that the height function here will have the Tracy Widom type asymptotics, and that goes back to my theorem one, where I claimed uh, Tracy Widom asymptotics for the polynuclear growth model. On the other hand, when t goes to one what will happen is that this product will have a different type of behavior. It will actually converge to a similar product, which will involve not just the smallest point of my point configuration, but it will involve the whole tail that lives at the edge of my partition. So this whole tail of which Tracy Widom is the edge is called the airy process and uh, the, the airy point process in the limit, AI. And um, so here one will observe um, something like um, the exponential with uh, some other constants, I don't know, beta, and then AI, the product over I. And it's this behavior that encodes the solution of the KPZ and the stochastic heat equation, okay? And it's that convergence of the product that's responsible for the second theorem, the convergence of the solution of the stochastic heat equation. And all those um, scary scaling constants, you know, the powers of minus three on the log and so on, they all show up, show up in the scaling limit on the edge of the partitions over here, which is um, a common computation for random matrices and, and, and for random partitions over there. I think my, my time is coming to, to a close and, and I think that this is roughly where I, I want to stop now. Um, I, I tried to... to <clears throat> to show that um, algebra is really helpful in, in trying to analyze large time asymptotics of, um, of important and, and, and simple looking probabilistic models. And not only it allows to, to get asymptotics of them, but it also allows to see connections between probabilistic models that are not visible from the very beginning. By going into the more abstract algebraic framework, one can actually, it's sort of like climbing a hill. Once you climb the hill, you can look left and you can look right and you see different scenery, but you know that you can descend from the hill into, into both of them and, and, and relate them be, be, between each other. Um, 
Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for hosting me in, in, in this conference. And let me echo um, Greg um, and thank the organizers for this very interesting event that I was able to enjoy online as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful talk and a strong way to finish the conference. People who are remote, if you want to ask a question, you can ask or say something in the, yeah, thank you, C, for pointing out the chat can be used. Um, we'll yeah. also certainly take questions from the audience here. I have one that I would be happy to start with because it's uh, relatively simple, perhaps. In your theorem one, yeah. um, the right-hand side, the Tracy Woodham distribution, you don't see the parameter T at all. Is that just because the intensity of the Poisson point process is one minus T, so the T dependence is sort of sucked into the normalization or? Mm, no, so, so the, the, the dependence of T, the intensity um, of one, one minus T is responsible for having these constants in the statement independent of T. So that's where the, the normalization of the intensity comes from. The fact that the Tracy Widom distribution itself is independent of T is a deep property of the Tracy Widom distribution as the universal limit um, for, um, you know, for, growth, for growth models in, in a fairly broad universality class. Um, well, I mean, of course, if you put a constant dependent uh, on T into the numerator here, you know, you can compensate by it by, by adding it over here. Um, it's the same as in any central limit theorem. But, but I guess the, the point that I, that I want to emphasize is that one expects that after proper normalization, one will still end up with the tracer widom distribution and not anything else. You know, potentially scaled, but that scale can always be moved um, to the left hand side. Thank you. Yes. Uh, very similar question. In, in the theorem two, is, uh, is it, was it surprising or was it expected that the, the limit doesn't depend on the rate at which epsilon goes to zero? Um, in, in the theorem two, uh, so let, I, I increased my volume. Could you repeat the last part of the question? In theorem two, should one expect what? Oh, so in theorem two, it looks like epsilon can go to zero at any rate. Uh, is, it, is it surprising or is that expected that it does not depend on the rate at which epsilon decays? No, epsilon, so um, yeah, the, the only, th so epsilon going to zero is, is really just uh, the statement that we are moving into the quadrant, you know, into the bulk of the picture. The important thing is the connection between the T parameter and the epsilon parameter. So epsilon parameter tells you how fast you're traveling, you're going into the quadrant, right? So your dis distance from the origin is epsilon to the power minus three. And, and the, the, the parameter T that, that's approximately one needs to be um, in exact agreement with that, with that distance. So it's, it's relation between this epsilon to the minus three and this E to the power minus epsilon that's important. Here. Further questions from the live side? I, I think there is a question on Zoom. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question about theorem one. Yeah. Theorem one relates to uh, input, which is Poisson in the quadrant. Uh, if you replace Poisson input by more general input, can you say anything? So um, the answer to that question is that conjecturally, the trace and Wittem distribution in the in the fluctuation limit should be independent of. Um, it, it might be simpler actually to to think about the discrete quadrant rather than the continuous one, and and just maybe place those nucleation events according to independent random variables in all the cells of the discrete quadrant. 
And so then it's natural to ask the exact question is, is, is if you consider different distributions on uh, uh, placing those nucleation events at each location, given that the locations are independent, do you expect to see tracer width and distribution in the limit of fluctuations of the height function? The question is yes, one very much expects that to happen. Whether anybody knows how to prove that, the answer is no. This is quite far from, from what people can do. For certain classes of distributions, um, like the Poisson that I use, or the geometric distribution, or the Bernoulli distribution, there is an algebraic framework in the spirit of what I, what I indicated that allows one to prove that tracy widen distribution. So there is a bunch of uh, cases which are integrable or algebraic in a sense, where one can do it. But doing it in general, you know, I really wish I, I, I knew how to, 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 to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, it should be there and it's not so far. No, it would make it a very universal theorem. Yeah, very much so. And, and you know, everybody expects that to hold, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, a, yeah, I mean, except for we have no idea. Thank you. Ah, yes, a question in the, the back. You can try to speak up and I'll repeat it if necessary. The question is in theorem two, how exactly are we seeing the Gaussian emerging from the scaling limit? Um, right. So um, if you consider, um, so the KPZ equation or the, the stochastic heat equation, if you consider it at very large times, then the solution will have tracy widen fluctuations. So that's convergence to one end. But if you consider it at, at infinitesimally small time, what you will see is the Gaussian behavior. What will happen is that this product of um, the solution and uh, the, uh, the space-time white noise in the infinitesimal time will actually get replaced by um, simply, well, maybe the whole right-hand side will get replaced by the second derivative plus the white noise. So it will be the stochastic heat equation with the additive white noise. And that object um, has ornstein uhlenbeck processes as a solution and that's the Gaussian object. So the Gaussian asymptotics or the Gaussian behavior is in an infinitesimally small time of the stochastic heat with multiplicative noise. And the Tracy Widom is the infinitesim is the infinitely large time of that equation. Further questions, either in person or remote? Now let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you very much.